Hello everyone. In the previous video, we talked about uh, consumer choice, the choice of somebody uh, on the demand side. Now we're going to talk about firms uh, and uh, producer choice, or the, su the supply side of the economy. One thing to keep in mind here, though, when we talk about production, we're not just talking about what you normally think of production, at, like factories or manufacturing. Productive activity is anything that combines inputs and produces outputs. Uh, so, for example, uh, a parent cooking a meal for their family is a productive activity. It does not show up in any economic statistics, but it is still a productive activity. Uh, back in the old days when you had to get water from a well, carrying that water uh, from the well to the house is a productive activity. So don't make the mistake of falling into this thinking about, oh, production, it has to be a firm, it has to be a manufacturer. No. Generally speaking, most producers are uh, companies, but it does not have to be that way. So on that note, let's talk about the theory of the firm. Why is it that we have a firm? Firms are, uh, firms exist uh, as a way of reducing transaction costs. We have not talked about transaction costs yet in this class. In a couple of videos, when we talk about externalities, we will uh, go into more detail about transaction costs. But what a transaction cost is, it's the cost to find someone to exchange with. When you go to the store, uh, part of, go, part of uh, that process is actually getting you in your car and going. That's a transaction cost. Firms reduce transaction costs by bringing together everybody who uh, is needed to make uh, a good or service uh, under one roof. That way, uh, you don't need to contract with every single person in the line. They're all under one roof. So if you think about an auto manufacturing plant, they have welders, they have electricians, they have uh, engineers, they have designers, they have human resources to make sure all these people get paid. They have a, a, a CEO and a management team to oversee all this. In a pure free, uh, in a purely uh, free market world, all those people would be contracting with one another uh, and there would be huge transaction costs. What the firm does is uh, brings all these people together so there doesn't have to be all these contracts. There's just sort of one contract with the firm. Uh, for our purposes, we're going to be primarily looking at private enterprises here, although the same theory uh, can be applied fruitfully to government. We'll talk about that in a couple of weeks when we talk about public choice. Uh, but for the most part, we're looking at private enterprises. It's when the ownership of businesses are uh, by private individuals, not by government. Uh, obviously, there are, are other forms. Uh, in an extreme case, you have your socialist or communist uh, countries, like the USSR um, or China, Cuba, where the government does own most businesses. Here in the United States, there have been periods, including the current one, uh, where um, some businesses have been taken over by government. Um, either directly or indirectly. Uh, Amtrak is a case where a, the government owns a business. Amtrak is owned by the federal government. Uh, indirectly, recently President Trump has enacted the um, Defense Authorization Act in order to uh, require companies who don't nor produce emergency medical equipment to produce that stuff. Um, so in this exact moment, we're in a position where uh, private enterprise is not uh, as large a part of the American economy as it normally is. But this is an unusual situation, so you, uh, we don't want to read too much into that. Um, I'm also going to introduce quickly the idea of uh, competition. Next week we're going to be talking about different uh, models of competition. In the extreme case, we have perfect competition where there are so many firms, no one can uh, 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 affect the price, and everybody sells pretty much the same good, identical goods. 
The other extreme of that is we have monopoly, where there's one firm selling one product and there's no competition. Then there's a spectrum we call monopolistic competition. Uh, next week, or the next lecture video is going to uh, cover primarily perfect competition and monopoly. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about monop monopolistic competition. Even though neither perfect competition nor monopoly exist uh, in a pure, firm, pure form in the real world, uh, they're actually very good at helping us understand the world. So we're going to focus ma mainly on those two extremes, not so much on monopolistic competition. Uh, but we'll get to that uh, more next week. Let's talk about individual firms. The firm uh, has what we call a profit function, where they're looking at total revenue and total cost. Revenue is a very straightforward thing. It's simply price times quantity. However, costs in the economic world mean something a little different. Typically, when uh, a person thinks about the costs that a business faces, they're looking only at explicit costs, rent, rent wages, uh, things like that, actual monetary payments. However, economists are also concerned about the opportunity cost, the implicit costs. This includes things like depreciation of goods, materials, and equipment, but also alternative opportunities for a firm. It's quite often that we'll see a firm who is making a uh, positive accounting profit, that is revenue minus explicit costs, but they still decide to shut down. That is because their implicit costs are too high, so their economic profit is actually negative. Uh, there was actually an example here in uh, Frederick. There was a, um, a, a small restaurant on Shab Row, and I can't remember its name, but there was an article in the Frederick News Post where they asked the owner, why are you shutting down? This place is always jammed. And he said, yes, we're making money. Uh, and he doesn't put it explicitly in these terms, but he says, our implicit costs are too high. So he's shutting down and he's reopening, uh, he's reopening um, the business along different lines uh, in order to try and capitalize on, uh, on those uh, gains, keeping the implicit costs down. So economists, we, cons we care about the total costs. And we're going to focus on economic profit, the total revenue minus the total costs. We're not going to be concerned a whole lot about uh, accounting profit. We're not going to be concerned a whole lot about accounting profit. It's economic profit that matters. And when we're talking about cost curves, as we will in a few minutes, we're talking about uh, these total cost curves. So we're looking at the long run and the short run. In the short run, firms uh, can adjust some of their uh, inputs, but not all of them. They can adjust some of their factors of production. These factors of production are, generally speaking, uh, five things. Natural resources, so land, raw materials, labor, the amount uh, of energy that we apply to transforming these, Capital, things like factories, machinery, uh, automobiles, uh, technology, which plays a big role, and entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship, think about it as um, the ability to recognize and act on a profit uh, opportunity, to notice an area where um, total revenue is going to exceed total costs and be able to act on that. It's actually a special skill. Um, and it takes uh, a certain amount of awareness um, to uh, be aware that these opportunities exist. <clears throat> what we can do is we can look at uh, how all these factors of production work together, and we create this relationship known as a production function, where we're going to say output, which is Q, and sometimes we're going to call it total production just to make things even more confusing. Output is a function of all these factors of uh, production. So some amount of natural resources, labor, capital, which is done with a K for reasons that actually go back to Karl Marx. Um, technology and entrepreneurship uh, go into producing our output. In the short run, we have fixed inputs and uh, variable inputs. 
for the sake of our discussion, we're going to say that our fixed inputs are our capital, K, and our variable inputs are our, are our labor, L. Fixed inputs can't be easily increased or decreased in a short period of time. So we're going to uh, hold them fixed. No matter uh, how much we produce, no matter uh, how much labor we put in, our amount of capital is going to stay the same. Variable inputs are things that uh, can uh, easily increase or decrease in a short period of time. Um, they're variable. So we're going to reduce our production function to output is simply a function of labor and capital. This is obviously a simplification, but we're going to go with it. We're going to define our short run and long run not by a specific unit of time, but rather uh, whether or not some factors are fixed and some factors are variable, or whether all factors are variable. In the long run, you can adjust anything. In the short run, you can't. So let's take an example of production in the short run and think about uh, lumberjacks. Uh, our output is going to be a function of labor and capital. Our labor here are the actual physical lumberjacks sawing. Our capital is going to be the number of saws that we have. In this case, we're actually going to assume uh, two-handed saws. Capital uh, in, the in the short run is going to be fixed, so we have only a set number of saws. But our labor is going to be variable. We can add and subtract uh, uh, lumberjacks as we need. So what we are going to be concerned about, and here's that magical word marginal again, we're going to be concerned about the marginal product of labor. In other words, how much production is adding one more laborer going to get us? So we're looking at the change in total production over the change of this laborer. And just like what we saw with diminishing marginal returns, uh, why the PPF uh, is curved, just like what we saw with diminishing marginal utility, we have a diminishing marginal productivity. Generally speaking, at some point, the additional uh, the addition of additional laborers uh, actually reduces the uh, marginal productivity. It might actually even go negative in some cases. So let's take this hypothetical example. And uh, here on the top, we have uh, our total production of trees. And down here, we have the marginal production of trees. So if we have one worker, that worker can cut down four trees a day. If we have two workers, we can now cut down 10 trees a day. If we add a third worker, we can now cut down 12 trees a day. A fourth worker, can, uh, we can now cut down 14 trees a day. The fifth worker, we can still only cut down 14 trees a day. So in terms of marginal productivity, that first worker can cut down four trees, so he adds the marginal product of four trees. That second worker, as a marginal product of six trees. That second worker uh, increases our total output by six. So four plus six gets us to this 10 up here. However, the third worker only allows us to add two more trees to total product. The fourth worker, only one. The fifth worker, none. So we have this diminishing uh, marginal productivity, or diminishing marginal product of workers. We can generalize this, and uh, these patterns hold for industry over industry over industry over time over time over time. And generally speaking, in the short run, total product looks something like this, this S-curve where it flattens out, might even start to decline depending. Uh, and marginal product, we get uh, this sort of hump and then downward uh, slope. Um, <clears throat> so... The firm faces a number of costs uh, in the short run and in the long run. They have to make a firm has to make factor payments. Uh, they have to pay for raw material and prices. They have to pay rent. They have to pay wages and salaries. They have to pay interest and dividends, and they have to pay profit. It's weird to think about profit as a cost, but to the firm, profit is a cost. It is what the entrepreneur gets. Um, so, profit is what's called a residu residual claimant, uh, a residual claim. Uh, 
The entrepreneur or the owner of the business is a residual claimant. What that means is after all the money has been paid to the other factors of production, to uh, natural resources, to land, to labor, to uh, capital, then and only then does the entrepreneur get to pocket some of it. So laborers are paid before the owner. It's not like the owner takes his cut and then it filters down to the rest of people. It's actually the opposite way. It filters up to, uh, to the entrepreneur. Uh, we can get into a conversation on then why is it that it, the owners of, say, Walmart make billions of dollars, whereas most workers are uh, making minimum wage, maybe a little bit more. That's a conversation for another time. Uh, so I'm going to punt on that right now. Variable costs are uh, costs like uh, labor. They're going to change in the short run. Fixed costs like rent uh, may, uh, may not switch, may not change in the uh, short run. Um, the total cost is merely the summation of these two. So uh, we're also going to be talking about, since this is over an entire production function, uh, average total cost, exactly what it sounds like, uh, total cost divided by quantity. We're going to be concerned about marginal cost. There's that magical word margin again. The change in total quantity by the change in, uh, uh, change in total cost over the change in quantity. And we're also going to be looking at the average variable costs. Your variable cost divided by the quantity of output. Uh, here we see a total cost curve. The total cost curve, because fixed costs exist, will never be, uh, never be exactly zero. Even if your production is at zero, uh, you're not producing any units, you still have to pay rent. Um, the, the total cost curve generally has this kind of up upward snaking S shape. Uh, that is because variable costs are added in and uh, uh, the average costs and your marginal costs are changing. So here we have the marginal costs, average total costs, and the average variable costs all laid out. Generally speaking, average total costs are this U-shaped thing. It's U-shaped. Average total costs uh, are going to be higher than marginal costs for a, a lot uh, but at some point, marginal costs are going to go higher. Average total costs are U-shaped because fixed costs are staying the same. Because fixed costs stay the same, the average fixed cost uh, is going to fall as you increase uh, quantity, uh, uh, your quantity outputted. Average variable costs are going to have so a similar shape, but even then, they're going to start rising. Um, average var variable costs must, by definition, be below average total cost. Uh, because uh, average total cost includes the fixed costs. Uh, for reasons we're not going, going to get into, uh, marginal cost intersects both the average, rail, average variable costs and average total costs uh, at their lowest point, and at some point just starts rising. Um, we're going to talk next week about the shutdown point. And the shutdown point, just to give you a bit of a uh, tip, is when price is below average variable cost. As long as your price is below average variable cost, that means you can't even pay the bills. You can't pay your workers to show up that day. So the firm shuts down. In the long run, all factors, are, uh, all factors of production are variable. That means there is no average, uh, there is no uh, total uh, fixed cost in the short, uh, in the long run. Everything is variable. Uh, all factors are variable because over time firms learn the factors of production that work best, they can adapt new technology. Um, and they can, firms can start to take advantage of economies of scale. We talked a little bit about economies of scale at the, uh, in the first video. And you might remember that was one of the things that Adam Smith looked at uh, with the division of labor of 
part of the reason why uh, countries end up getting wealthier. So to properly define economies of scale, it's a situation where your average cost of production falls as your quantity of production increases. At point S here, uh, if a factory is producing 1,000 units, their average cost of production is $12 per unit. As production increases to say 2,000, average cost of production falls and up to 5,000, etc. In a situation like this, if you're a plant and you're operating at point S, uh, there's an incentive to expand and try to get down to point L here uh, where you can uh, lower your costs, thus lower your prices and hopefully uh, outcompete other uh, people in the market. Um, what's important to know is that we have the long run average cost curve and the short run average cost curve. They're exactly what they sound like. The average cost curves in the short run, the long run average cost curve is in the long run. All of these have economies of scale to them. Uh, there's a certain period where short run average cost curves uh, fall and then rise and there are longer periods for uh, the long run average cost curve. The long run average cost curve is simply um, made up of the, uh, the uh, short run average cost curves. Um, and we can see that there are three basic areas of economies of scale. Um, from uh, Q1 to Q2 here, this is generally economies of scale. Costs of production, average cost of production is falling as quantity is increasing. Between Q2 and Q4 here, this is a constant return to scale. Your average costs are staying the same as you increase production. Diseconomies of scale are uh, the opposite of economies of scale. Your cost, average cost of production is increasing as your output is increasing. <clears throat> Generally speaking, you don't want to be in diseconomies of scale. That means you're producing too much, it's costing too much, you want to cut back on production. Not every industry is going to have the long, flat bottom of um, constant returns to scale. Some industries, uh, like the one here on the left, are going to have a single low point at, say, 10,000 units here. At this point, the uh, really only one firm can exist, making 10,000 units. They're facing, um, they're facing uh, a specific cost curve. If they produce more or less, uh, the average costs are going to be high or higher. Uh, and there'll be incentive to lower the cost of production. However, when you have a long period of constant returns to scale, like uh, this chart on the right, a number of firms can exist because different levels of output uh, can all exist as they try to meet market demand. Uh, next week, when we talk about uh, monopolies, uh, economies of scale are part of the reason why a monopoly uh, can form in the uh, economic world. So uh, this conversation will, will uh, matter. This conversation will, uh, will matter uh, a lot more. Um, but Point R here on this right hand or left hand side graph indicates really uh, one firm, maybe two, um, but uh, not much more than that, really one. Uh, whereas the right hand graph, a number of different firms can exist depending on the size of the market. So that is uh, industry costs uh, in general. The firm is going to try and minimize costs. They want to produce where costs are minimized and thus profit is maximized. Next week, we're going to talk about a different industry structure. We're going to talk about perfect, uh, competi perfectly competitive markets. We're going to talk about uh, monopolies. Uh, and we're going to talk about the meaning of competition, uh, how it's used generally in economic models but also a more robust theory of competition uh, that your book does not go into, OpenStax does not go into, uh, that I'm going to be drawing on the work of Frederick von Hayek, uh, who was an Austrian-American economist, and uh, GMU econ professor uh, Don Boudreau. So see you next time.